In this week's art show, we're getting you ready for Valentine's Day. We went down to Arts Hub 47, a community cooperative located in Lark Lane, who's hosting a special exhibition full of love. Ruth Kinnan, general manager, gave us more details about this arts and craft display, but also on what makes this little shop a hub for local artists. Hi, I'm Ruth. I'm from Arts Hub 47 on Lark Lane. We're a community cooperative. Um, we're a shop, gallery, workshop space, studios, uh, laptop use. Um, we've been here on Lark Lane since October 2012. Uh, this is our third year. Yeah. Today we've got an exhibition on the love theme. Um, it's basically just on um, Valentine's, love, everything love. Um, we've actually had this themed exhibition for the last three years. Um, we found it very popular. People are very keen to get their loved ones alternative unique gifts. So um, we've done, yeah, so this is our third love exhibition um, and it features a selection of different co-op members, uh, different artists, some that are more keen to use the heart theme. Um, and then obviously we have a whole lot of cards and gifts downstairs. And there's a display in the window also that complements this room up here. There's about eight people's work in here. Uh, and then as I say, there's some more stuff in the window downstairs. We've got uh, collage, we've got printmaking, embroidery, uh, this beautiful vase made by Cass. We've got hand-painted crockery, cards, paper cutting, mosaicing, handmade dolls on the theme of different love themes, prints and uh, letter crossing and pillows and cushions. So we've got a, quite a large selection and bags and stuff. Initially, um, after our first few months of the shop being open, we were very, we've always been very conscious about trying to make the rent, obviously, because we're volunteering, we hadn't got um, any funding initially. So uh, we just thought we'd try, you know, this was our first exhibition in the first, after, after Christmas, you know, when we first opened, and uh, it's, just, it's just a nice theme, people like it, and uh, it's usually quite successful, so it usually does quite well on the sales. So it was just to bump the sales after Christmas, you know, when suddenly January goes very quiet. So uh, hopefully sales go up again, which was what happened as I sold two mosaics yesterday. <laughs> Ten minutes, so yeah, it does very well. It's a nice theme. Everybody volunteers. We get money for the annual subscription. Each artist pays towards helping with the running costs of the shop. We take a 30% commission, which is probably one of the lowest in the city. Um, so it's good for the artists because they make, you know, 70% of the money. We um, also, as I say, we have a monthly exhibition. So it gives everyone a chance to do something different. They can also uh, rent the space upstairs for 10 to 15 pound for a, a whole half a day. So they can do workshops and make other money. And we're very supportive of new artists who've never had work anywhere before. We look after our artists as much as we can and help them with any publicity, anything they need to know about. We have like a network between us all that we offer. We have, um, well, we, we used to have a monthly meeting, like an artist group, but that's gone to like every three months now. Maybe we could just meet up and have a coffee and catch up. And we can tell them, you know, how things have been going, what's been happening, what the sales are good on, what's selling, what's not selling. And we also have like little social occasions, like we had like one for one before Christmas for all the artists and volunteers, and there'll be like food, and then we had a DJ, and you know, just sort of to, to thank people because obviously when people are not getting paid, you want to give them something back. Um, and then we have an annual AGM where obviously all the accounts are explained, and people get a chance to vote, and they get a chance to hear what's actually been happening, you know, which artists have had an exhibition, um, things that are coming up. And we just like people to be as involved as they can. Obviously, some people um, have full-time work, and it's just a sort of a hobby for them. And other people, it's it's a bit more, a bit more of a job. So it's quite an eclectic. There's about about 120 different artists, and we have many different fields. You know, we've got uh, knitting, handwoven stuff, crocheting, embroidery, 
uh, pencil drawing, printmaking, screen printing, painting on canvases, mosaics, ceramics. We have a lot of ceramics from the potters who are up here in the community centre in Lark Lane Old Police Station. There's a pottery school there. So they have a lot of work in and we sell a lot of pottery. It does very well because it's local. Um, we've got the guy that does music, so he's trying to get things going on that. Uh, we also have um, book reading and writers clubs and then people can come in and use the laptops. Um, free, I think it's free for our first half an hour and then two pounds for the next. So just try and have availability for people, for our artists. If they need to print something out, they can come in if they can't get to a printer or whatever. Me and a couple of the other girls were already members of a housing cooperative. So we were, we, we were quite keen to try and do something that was a bit more we ran it ourselves, you know, that it was, uh, you know, we made the decisions and, and, and we could do anything really, you know, nothing was out of limits and um, we're all a bit mad like that, so we'll volunteer to do, you know, we'll try anything, you know, we've had like little events in the backyard, we've got like a big yard we share with next door, we've had music events out there and as I say, we, when Sound City was on last year, we had um, the floor men, a band, local band, playing actually in the shop with the drums, the whole lot, you know, and everyone was outside in the street looking in, wondering what was going on. So I like that idea that we can do anything. We take the 30% commission on the sales. Uh, I also do mosaic workshops here, and that money goes to the co-op. Um, so that helps towards the rent. Then we have studio rental with the rooms upstairs, so that goes towards the monthly money. And then this, these rooms can be rented out for exhibition spaces um, or for a shop or for whatever people might want to use the rooms for. Um, this front room is rented out for £30 for seven days, back room £20. If you want the both, it's £40. And we have like, um, a, like a vintage clothing shop in a couple of weeks. They're having the two rooms as a little shop. Um, and then all that money comes together and it, it just about covers all the bills. But we have some months in the year which are much better. You know, over Christmas we've made quite a few thousand, so that will help us if we struggle with money and stuff. But, uh, yeah, we just about tick over. Just about. <laughs> but I think that's because none of us are taking a wage yet. You know, it's very much, you know, we volunteer and, and, and it, you know. But I think um, the whole idea of keeping the shop afloat is what we're all into. I suppose I don't realise it's here so, so different. We have had quite a few visitors. You know, from um, we had some people over from Poland, and some people from um, Belfast to come and see how another cooperative works. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's a dynamics of the people. We're all, you know, we all bring something different, and we all kind of complement each other. And, and, and um, you know, we have a committee meeting once a month, and we try and, you know, discuss new ideas and you know, trying to do the accounts and be a bit more efficient than we were initially because, as I said before, we never, um, we didn't have a business plan. We didn't, you know, decide how and what we would do. You know, it was, it's very much, we've learned as we've, you know, by the seat of your pants, as the saying goes, <laughs> you know, but uh, new people have come on board and they bring, you know, new strengths. And I think this year we think, you know, we're ready to start making some plans, maybe, you know, that we are definitely here. So, you know, maybe a five-year plan as to what we'll do. It's, it's lovely because well, you have like, obviously, you know, lots of artists all pop in, they'll have a cup of tea, they'll, you know, meet other artists. So people are not on their own so much at home working because a lot of them are solitary artists. You know, they can come in and have a bit of company, see what's selling, you know, meet. It's very much a hub where people can come and meet. It's not just, you know, a shop. We like people to come in and, you know, a lot of them are, we're all good friends now, and you know it's it's um it's like a cent you know like a little centre they can come to you know so they can feel at home and you know just uh, just a, like a, a comfortable you know like a little hub <laughs> little hub and there's always coffee and tea and we usually have cake when we have the you know launches and things like that and as I say we've had little parties and little socials for people maybe it is unique I don't know I'm here so much I don't notice. <laughs> We're hoping to try and do an exhibition for the jewellers or the people that have jewellery in the shop up here. The only thing with that is that we need to bring some of the cabinets up from downstairs and stuff so people can have their work, you know, in different glass cabinets. But we just thought, for a change, they don't get much of a look in in any of the exhibitions. Um, last year we did a thing where we had a, 
we'd give like the window over to certain artists so they could have like their own work, just one person in the window. And that did quite well. So we're thinking about having all the jewellery people having sort of work in here. And then I think we're hopefully getting the potters up the street. They're going to be doing another exhibition maybe in June. And a lady, Irene um, Anka, she does wood turning and stuff and glass and wood and things. So she's going to have an exhibition in May. And then we're going to, obviously, when Sound City's on again, we're going to have a music theme again of something. So Roger Edwards, who, who did the soundscape music in here, he's busy writing something for that. And we'll probably have some more bands on and things downstairs or stuff outside. We're just going to try and, you know, do different themes. I think this year we thought sort of um, themes and media, you know, like maybe paper, maybe, you know, denim, maybe, you know, just try different ideas because obviously we've all, um, a lot of the artists have already had exhibitions last year when they'd have the main, you know, the main room. So we need to think about something a little bit different. Plus also we want to do stuff connected with what's happening in Liverpool. Obviously when the, uh, the three graces, you know, when the, the three ships are coming, it's that May, isn't it, in June, we might have a maritime theme again. I mean, some of these things we've done before, but people are always do different different pieces of art to it so yeah we're going to probably try and keep connected with some of the some of the things that are going on and one of our artists um, Hannah all right she's um, chocolate envelope she does uh, cards and paper wrap and paper I think she's been chosen as one of the women of the business you know business Liverpool thing so she was supposed to try and have an exhibition for the Arabic festival but She's very busy at the moment. So we just, yeah, we, we're a bit looser this year. We're not quite on it. <laughs> we will be though, you know, so there will be more, more exhibitions. The exhibition Full of Love will run until the 15th of February, every day but Monday. To find out more about the co-op and its events, go on www.artshub47.co.uk. Next on Bay TV Liverpool, we're heading off to Los Angeles with artist Ilona Gaynor, who will tell us everything about her interactive forensic exhibit at FACT. The Under Black Carpets um, is a kind of really broad study and a look at uh, bank robberies as a way to explore how the legal system works in America. It is about a heist, it's also not about a heist. So the way that the objects are designed uh, behind us is looking at how objects are represented in the court of law. So the objects aren't designed necessarily for the audience that come to this gallery, but they're, they're more or less designed to hold a conclusive discussion inside a court for the jury. So they're designed for a series of jury members to kind of experience a story, I suppose, where we could try and hope to convict someone for a fake crime. The work looks at how objects can be shown or viewed to a jury to kind of gather some sort of veracity in a testimony so that each of the objects other than the kind of research material looks at how if it to be wheeled into a court what those objects would speak of and how they might speak about things. For example this is a map of Los Angeles and it's made of um, acrylic designed to look like black glass uh, with etchings in it that are white and it's the kind of material that you see in lobbies in LA for huge sky rises. And it's designed to look that way and when a jury makes assessments over objects, for example a lawyer would hire a designer and this is the, the kind of the way that things are done most frequently um, in sort of contemporary law in America, is if for example a um, the jury members were looking at a cardboard constructed model, they wouldn't see as much truth in the object as they would if it had some solidity, for example. Or if the object was made of gold, they would think that their clients were too rich and therefore they want to buy the jury. So there's all sorts of like pros and cons of weighing up this situation. During this project, I trained as a police officer in Los Angeles for six months, um, learning how the police might think um, when attending a robbery that would happen in downtown Los Angeles. So it was a way to kind of counter design how you might go about doing that. So there, there is a definite heist that's been designed and then it's been deconstructed after that. So this, what you see behind us is chapter one um, of the heist. There's six chapters, so throughout the next few years I'll be revealing the, the, final, the final six. 
So this is the first one. There are images on the wall um, of my time in the LAPD. There's a map on the wall looking at the various... Um, I had six assistants working for the banks as um, cleaners, watching what was going on, pretending to be real estate agents, looking at the kind of surrounding buildings, what was in them, what the views were, all these kinds of like... Um, I guess it's just plain research, really. It's sort of been designed on purpose to be a little bit confusing. If you were a detective responding to a situation, which I happened to be during those six months, you're often confronted with a kind of melee of evidences and your job is to try to kind of piece them together. So what we see here is an index of things where the, the narrative is really cloudy and the only time the narrative will be fully revealed is when the six chapters are complete. Um, so this is obviously just chapter one. And the, what happens in chapter one is um, a plane crashes into one Wilshire. One Wilshire is a hotel carrier in LA. And what that is, it's, like, it's essentially a, ter it's a government post for internet for internet servers and fiber cables, it's basically just a, a building of fiber cables. But it's the biggest terrorist target in America, and it was designed purposely to look old and decrepit as a building, to make it look like it was from the 70s, so that no one would ever assume there's any sort of contemporary technological data inside. So it has these fake antenna on it, you can see it in LA. It's, there's also no such address as One Wilshire, despite it's the only build, it's not on a map. It's the only building that's called One Wilshire, but there's no One Wilshire. And in that building, there's only one floor which is occupied, which is the 40th floor. The rest is an empty shell, which is completely bizarre, right? So if you were going to distract police in LA, because there's hundreds of police, and as we know, they're kind of notoriously violent, um, you would just knock out the one building that everyone's watching, I suppose. And then you've got a chance to, to take down the five banks that I've proposed here. So throughout the, the next four chapters, it will be revealing how we do that architecturally, how we get into vaults architecturally, and how we escape with the money. There are various clues around the room, uh, a series of characters or people that are involved in the robbery. Um, there's an index to accompany the work, and there are various clues on the model that, that suggest a series of numbers where you can see kind of strategic patterns and trajectories of people heading to certain areas of the city. So yeah, the audience is asked to kind of look around and, and have, a, have a think about what these are. During my time at the Royal College of Art, my um, final piece of work, I suppose, was to design the kidnap of a wealthy woman in Los Angeles. Um, I had her followed for, for roughly about six months, using, paying, paying a private detective to find out all I could. And then I worked um, at Hiscox Insurance Company and sat, sat with a few of the board members of Hiscox. And what we did was we calculated how the best way to kidnap her would be and in what way we could make a profit from, from her uh, being gone from her husband. So this is kind of like a big, a big story with a map of objects. And then I just kind of, I got more and more involved in doing this kind of work. And now I run a company called the Department of No, where we do genuinely investigate uh, big, big money fraud cases for people. During my time in LA, the LA Police Academy, the LAPD Police Academy, was located north of Hollywood. And when police would come back from certain situations, they would start describing the scenes that they had seen as if they were in a film. So they'd start saying it was like in that film Heat, or it was like in that film uh, Magnolia, or whatever. And they'd start describing these realities with these films that they'd seen in the last 20th century of cinema that were just sort of filmed down the road. And so there's this really interesting juxtaposition of how memory and conjecture works into the narrative. So during the rest of this chapter sort of sets out an architectural premise, whereas the other chapters kind of detail much more how conjecture can relate much more interestingly to a heist, pulling trapdoors out of the air and, and various kind of um, conjectural based knowledge.